Chuck. Are you sideways? Why? <laughs> what's up? There he is. All right. What's up, man? Man, dude, yeah, how you been? I didn't see it coming. Uh, I mean, up until around March, pretty good. I had uh, big plans for the season. So 2019 track wise went pretty well. And, um, you know, I was just gearing up for the last bit of training before the Olympic Games in the summer. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I've had right. a few my nagging uh, injuries and stuff like that, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, more of the same. How you been? Not bad, man. It's same, same thing. I mean, I was, um, one of my buddies, uh, opened up a strength and conditioning facility back out here in Mass. Um, and he called me up and was like, I want you to work for me. So we were slowly building that up, and I was slowly getting more. I had a whole baseball academy to myself in Northern Mass, okay. and uh, I was helping him out with like field sports because he's a hockey guy, so he wanted like a field sport specific guy. And he yeah. just, uh, and then this happened, and like I'm literally on, I'm like two minutes away from the door at the baseball facility. I get a phone call, and the guy that owns the thing is like, "We're shutting down at six tonight. Like, don't come in. We don't know what's going on." And that was the conversation. Really? I call him up. I'm like, "What's going on right now?" Like, you know. So ever since basically March, like, 16th or something, same thing, you know, just being yeah. at home, Still like, well. figuring it out, you know, so. Yeah, but, yeah, man, all right, well, so I don't know if you've looked into the podcast at all, or what we do, but um, our goal, basically, is we're trying to combine training, fitness, health, and stuff like that with the weeby nerd anime gaming culture. We're trying to figure out a way to cross that bridge because I feel like it's something that's never been done before. And okay. growing up, I was a big, like, I mean, I have freaking DBZ behind me. You know what I mean? I got like a Gundam <laughs> wing model over here. I'm wearing an anime t-shirt, right? You know what I mean? Like it's been part of my yeah. life for so long. And I had a friend that, um, she was like a world record holding power lifter. Um, and so we kind of met at a weightlifting club once and we were like, we should do something to try to bring both together. And here we are, you know? Yeah, um, very cool. Yeah, so I'm just going to get going, I guess. We're going to start this like a normal podcast. Welcome to Weaves and Weights. Yeah. I don't even know what episode this is. Whatever. Doesn't matter. Um, special guest today, Chuck Enikwechi, big time thrower, silver at the 2018 Commonwealth Games. I'm embarrassing you here right now, just so you know. Right. Um Gold at the okay. 2018 <laughs> African Championships, gold at the 2019 All Africa Games, threw at Purdue, um, all in shot put, right? Those were all shot. Uh, all the medals were shot. Put, all the medals yeah. were shot. Do you, you do other? What are the other events that you do? As yeah. Well? So uh, at Purdue, I threw the hammer. I won three Big Ten titles, and uh, I also threw the weight. I won um, two bronze, um, three bronzes, and a silver. Okay. 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 Um, so. What was your background before that? I mean, because you obviously, I mean, you were in track and field, right, before that. And, how, like, was there more to it? I think I saw a post the other day that you, like, were running at one point. You were doing sprints, like 200s, 100s, something like that. Yeah, and... so um, when I started uh, track in high school, you know, of course it was New York City. So it wasn't a very expansive yeah, yeah, um, yeah. experience. So, you know, whenever they wouldn't have shot put at meets, which happened about half the time, coach would put me in a 100 meter dash or the 200 meter dash so that's what uh smart some coach. Of those pictures are from that's a smart coach though he knew what he was doing kind of you know uh, i don't think so really i think, I think no? it's a little bit long for uh yeah i mean at the time i'm like 220 okay yeah you were a big uh, boy yeah yeah yeah, so yeah. You, you don't really want to run for that long you know? yeah, yeah. At 55 maybe it makes more sense but, yeah, yeah yeah for sure yeah yeah okay but was... before before was that no, keep going, keep going. What else? Did you, did you do yeah, anything else before that? No. It's always track. been track and field, really. Okay. Yeah. All right. How'd you how'd you get into track and field? How did that start? How, where was like was there like a pivotal moment that you like threw a rock at somebody or something? Was like I could do this, or was it like oh, a damn, damn near? So you know, we're talking <laughs> about being nerdy and stuff. Um, I'm a huge WWE fan. Okay. And um, you know, I'm watching guys like you know um, Eddie Guerrero, oh yeah, Kane, The Undertaker, and stuff, and all these these big guys and I just wanted to be as big as them some way, somehow. And, um, I saw a documentary on, um, kind of the behind the scenes, you know, um, training and stuff that they go through. And yeah, yeah. It was WCW. And, um, I saw that Chris Benoit would do like 300 squats before a match, which to me just blew my mind. Yeah. So there I am Saturday morning doing 300 squats. You know, I wasn't part of a team or anything. I think I was like 12 at the time or so. Okay. So, 
I figured, you know, I'm getting ready to go into high school soon. And um, basically every high school boy wants to be a part of the team. So I want to be a part of the team, but I especially wanted to lift weights. So my first day of um, sophomore year of high school, we're sitting there and the um, PE coach was like, what do you guys want the class to be? So I raised my hand. I said, uh, can it be weight training? And he looked, he was like, um, okay, I'll talk to the other coach. So he talked to the weight training coach and then got a time slot for us to work out. Uh, and that led me to the track coach. Okay. So I wanted to lift weights in gym class, but I wanted to lift weights, you know, just kind of on my own time. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. The only way I could do that was to be a part of a varsity team. Okay. So that's where the track coach came in. He's like, hey, you know, you have access to the weight room if you come out and throw for me. And at the time, I didn't know what the hell throwing was. Right, I didn't for know sure. discus or shot put. Yeah. So I look it up on YouTube, and um, I'm kind of the guy that says yes before kind of oh, yeah. knowing how to do something. Yeah. So I say, yeah, all right, I'll do it. Filled out the medical form, got my uh, my physical done, and then I was part of the team. And then I went on YouTube and saw the guys who were, like, launching it, especially out in New Jersey, uh, Rhode Island, you know, that – there was some talent coming out of the Northeast. So I looked it up. I was like, you know what? That's something I could probably do. And the goals were kind of to be the Queensboro champion and then the New York City champion. Right, New right. York State champion. And it just kind of kept building throughout the last uh, three years of high school. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, so you were setting yourself, like, smaller goals. It wasn't like, like Olympics was the first thing. It was like, I want to lift weights. And the only way for you yeah. to lift weights was get on the team. And then after yeah. that, it was like, okay. So you started falling in love. So the weight room kind of brought you to to throwing really um Absolutely. Yep. okay yeah i mean i have a freaking question way down the line about that but you already answered it that's perfect you know um yeah. so okay oh you guys threw a wrench in my my plans here you already went ahead of me baby <laughs> all right i got you all right so when um did you know that you wanted to continue with throwing after that or is it still like i just want to be you know did i want to go to the w wcw want to be part of you know like stuff like that well, was that the thing is um you know, so I won the Queens Championship. Yeah. Then I won the city championship, and then I won the state championship my senior year. For sure. But um, the thing is, as soon as I threw sixty feet, because there's always benchmarks in every sport, you know, basketball, football, right? Where you hit a certain stat, and then the coaches all of a sudden get interested. So for shot put, especially at the time, I'm thinking like 2011, that mark was sixty feet, and it just so happened my first throw of my first meet of senior year, I threw 60 feet, one inch. Okay. So at like 12 o'clock that random Saturday morning, coaches started to write in and send <laughs> questionnaires and stuff. So all of a sudden I'm going for, cause like I was applying to schools in like Staten Island and Manhattan and Brooklyn yeah. and just planning on staying home. Cause that's the cost effective thing. Right. Um, we didn't think about scholarships or anything like that. But as soon as I threw that 60 footer, which was again, the first throw the first meet that year, you know, I started getting interest but the thing is, and you know this, the recruiting process goes on junior year. Yeah. And I was kind of a late developer, like a late bloomer. So by the time I was throwing far enough, all the money was gone as far as scholarships. Right. Except for maybe a, a few schools. So like the Arizona States and Michigan, Michigan State and schools like that would write me. But they're basically asking how much I can pay, which, I mean, D1, you know, bigger schools, that's a lot of money big old so, zero is your answer that's what uh, I exactly, <laughs> exactly so the, the list got long and then got really short yeah uh, there was only a couple scholarships left and uh came down to either buffalo or, or purdue university and then i took the visit to purdue again it's crunch time it's my senior year and then um signed right away but it was a scholarship that you know made me stick to track and field yeah because i was expecting like most people to you know do sports through high school be happy with the experience and then move on. Right. But um, that's that scholarship. Just say hey, you get five more years to continue doing this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, how was how was the transition from from high school? Because obviously, like you said, like you you got into it because you wanted to do the weight room stuff like that, and then found out that you had, you know, you had what you had, you had it. You know what I mean? Like you, that was you. So, and then they started yeah. coming at you, throwing you scholarships. All these teams or coaches, coaches are coming at you, stuff like that. Like. What was the difference in like the realization to you going from high school to college, and like how did that change when you got there? Like, did you what was your expectation, and was it different, like different than what you thought it was gonna be? You know? Yeah, um, I really didn't have too much uh, built up expectation just because it wasn't something I had eyed. Right. A lot of 
D1 athletes or D2 athletes, you know, they, they have those uh, offers on the table or they have schools that they're targeting. Yeah, for and sure. For me, I, I just, I didn't have that list up until my last year of high school. So in a sense, I was going in totally blind. You know, yeah. all I was was the physical, um, you know, the the frame that can possibly evolve into a, a D1 athlete. But, you know, as far as the mindset and stuff like that, I didn't have a point of reference. I didn't right, have right. friends that were on teams. Yeah, okay, um, yeah. And then also I wound up taking the one visit because, you know, time was kind of running out. So um, I just – I think what I expected was – a super tight um you know community to where your friend circle would be just the team yeah um and then just kind of more of the same like basically my high school experience except a level up right, right, right. I expected um i gotta say it was a lot more cutthroat than i expected yeah as far as both the competition <laughs> and even within the team it was yeah. kind of like you know people were everyone's gunning for that that number one oh 100 percent right that, that, you know if you want to be making the bus or you know for us that's like being a starter you know right. if you want to make that bus to the track meets um be on the big 10 team or qualify for nationals or um, even as far as competitions because track and field is kind of like except for sprinting sprinters are kind of douchebags but um <laughs> as far <laughs> it's true though you know, as far as as throwers go, uh, you know, we're all friends, kind of. Yeah. Um, similar to like powerlifting, uh, I think you might see the same thing in Olympic lifting, to where there's a lot of camaraderie. Mm -hmm, for sure. And, um, Especially now. The thing yeah. is, yeah. Yeah. But at the D1 level, it's a little bit less because I think people are kind of seeing that window close on them a little bit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as far as time, because we're on that clock. Right. You have four or five years to be the best you can possibly be. So it's a little bit cutthroat at the higher level, uh, more so than I expected. Yeah. Um, and then the other part is the coaching. So now I'm not dealing with, and, and this is no offense to them, I'm a, I'm a high school coach now too. Right. But um, I'm not dealing with somebody who's just interested in the sport or interested in the weight room. Now I'm dealing with experts. Right. So that's a whole different thing. You know, it's yeah. whatever I thought I was squatting or whatever I thought I was pulling or how good I was that goes out the window because these guys either know it firsthand or they know it secondhand in the classroom or they have a combination of both. Right. And, um, that's, that was a different, it was kind of intimidating at first, but luckily I was 18 years old. So I was kind of on the, you yeah, know, yeah, on yeah. The upswing as far as development. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's funny. My, um, so one of my buddies, uh, he was a thrower in Arizona. I forget what school he went to. He's gonna if he hears this, he's gonna hate me because we talk, we've talked about you a million times because he waitlists with me at one of the gyms. Okay. And he was a thrower out in Arizona, and uh, I was like, yeah, like I trained with this guy Chuck out at Purdue. Like he's like he's awesome. Like he's a thrower. He's like, wait, like Chuck, Chuck, like the Chuck. I was like, yeah. He's like, <laughs> man. He's like that guy scares the shit out of me every time I lift with like every time we like threw against each other or whatever. I saw him at a meet, right. And like I was like, yeah, I remember the first story. I remember the first like the first time I met you. They were redoing uh, Molenkoff, right? So we're all over in yeah. uh, Mackey, and all of a sudden I just hear doom, 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 and I look to my right, and you're like broad jumping through the friggin' turf we have, and you had like you bounded through it in like two seconds. And I'm like, I have no idea what's happening right now. This guy is an absolute monster. Um, but he was saying how like you're at meets and stuff like that, and like as people are getting ready to throw, like you're tapping your shoes, you're doing all that stuff, like kind of like mess with oh, yeah. each other a little bit, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So it's funny you say that, you know. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I remember like just like you guys being in the weight room, like you coming in and like lifting with the guys and the throwers and the girls and stuff like that. Like just, I mean, us lifting together, like that was probably one of the best groups to have in the weight room at all time. Like everyone wanted to be there. They knew how important like that aspect of it. And and all I mean coach had the same theory, you know? Like he was like, "Listen, like this is just as important." And that's why he was so he was there the whole time. He was watching. He wanted to make sure things were done in a way that he knew worked for his athletes. And like yeah. but it was a blast, man. I mean, like even with Ryan, like Ryan fun. had the perfect energy for you guys too. Like it was like I know I know like he wasn't like specifically your coach, you know, but right. Yeah, but it was, uh, yeah, man, it was, you guys are uh, like a different breed of people, you know, but it's fun at the same time. Like everything you guys do is energetic. It's, 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 it's go time. It's, you know, help each other out, but I'm still coming for you. Like you were saying earlier, like, you know, and right. that's, but that's part of like, you ever heard the whole, the whole saying, like never be the strongest person in the gym. Mm -hmm. You ever heard that before? Sure. Right. So like, yeah. 
there's there's something being said like okay that person's a little bit better than me and i always need to be on their ass and hopefully we can kind of force each other to get better you know like that's kind of you gotta have somewhere you to know. go right exactly um so since we're already on the expectations versus reality kind of thing like obviously like if people people don't know this yet but you throw for nigeria still still right you're still yeah. okay um you know that that transition how did how did that happen like how was that transition from college to pro what was that expectation and change like what's that like yeah, going so, out there to the international competition and being like surrounded in this giant you know all those guys that are probably what a foot and a half taller than you at least <laughs> like, give or take give yeah or take. you know what i mean but, uh, <laughs> hey you're out there doing somersaults and having a good time though and they all look miserable so there's that you know oh yeah yeah definitely you, you know, i always tell myself that they're out there to watch me yeah um, hell yeah okay that, sometimes that's true sometimes it's not but it's it's good motivation you know yeah so just when i'm out there i want to be there physically prepared but at the same time, give the crowd something to watch. Right? For sure. Shake the officials' hands and, you know. But, um, yeah, the, the transition from college to professional, um, it wasn't as big as maybe in the money sport like basketball or football where you're, you know, you, you do your pro day and you get drafted or right. part of a big organization or anything like that. For me, it was, um, it was basically the same experience as college, except now, you know, I don't have teammates to rely on and stuff. But I do still work out with the track team, which is awesome. Okay. Um, the coaching stayed the same. Sports med stayed the same because uh, I immediately signed up as a volunteer assistant. Um, and the main difference is I can now accept money that I earn at track meets. So that's kind of, that's what pays the bills, just prize money or yeah, yeah, yeah. grant money that comes from the um, sports federations. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I knew I wanted to go pro. This was a little different from high school. So my sophomore year, when I threw 19 meters in the shot put and um, 65 meters in the hammer, and I was just like, you know what? Because I had such a, I had an average uh, true freshman year. Okay. And um, I threw 16, 20 in the shot put and 58 meters in the hammer and uh, 19 meters in the weight throw. And these are not really good marks at all. And um, I just from age 18 to 19 things spun up yeah yeah so in the shot put for example i literally gained nine feet which is like it makes no even thinking about it now like now that i'm throwing 21 80 almost 22 meters it still doesn't make sense how big a jump i made from freshman to right. sophomore year but it happened and you know all i was doing was going to the dining courts eating as much as i can <laughs> um yeah going to the uh the indoor facility and throwing and sometimes i'm getting it wrong sometimes i'm getting it right but I think I was lucky enough to figure out how many different ways I can get it wrong mm. before nailing a few ways to get it right. Right. So that 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 ten months, a lot of kids look at it as um, kind of a punishment. Like you don't get to compete, you don't get to play in front of your friends and family and stuff like that. But for me, I was like, okay, I'm undersized coming out of high school, and they're giving me an extra year to get bigger, stronger, and smarter. So I, it was, it was a field day to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So see, but you had the, you had the right mentality going into it, you know, like, and I think, and tell me if I'm wrong on this. I mean, this is just like my, like analysis from like what we just talked about, but like you were saying how like a lot of these kids for basketball, football, whatever, like their eyes are already set on, I want to go play for Michigan. I want to go play for, you know, whoever, it doesn't matter, Duke, whatever. Right. And so like for Mm -hmm. them, they already have that extra stress and that extra, I want to get better, need to get better. And for you, you were just like. All right, like this is this is just something to get better, you know. And like for them, they exactly. were there was a different mindset there. Where like you were just surprised, like okay, I'm getting better. You had professionals that were able to help you, and you absorbed it like a sponge, you know. That's mm-hmm. so sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but no, it was it was a good time. That that's all it was. Just uh, more resources, more opportunities, and um, just I was linking up with people, you know, through social media and stuff like that. So for sure, it was yeah. just a, a great development throughout college, and. Um, but that, that first to second year is kind of when I realized that I might have what it takes to go to the next level. Okay. And um, I had talked with my coach at the time, Keith McBride. I was like, you know, whatever happens after I graduate, I kind of want to stick around here um, just because things are working. So, you know, whatever's working, you don't really want to change it. Right. Because the grass isn't always greener. There's right. a lot of guys that, and no disrespect to them, but they'll like, as soon as they graduate, they'll go to somewhere down south or out west where it doesn't rain. Um, you know, they want a training facility and stuff like that, a training group, um, or to join a program. And 
I think it's a great idea, but the problem is it may not work perfectly for everybody. Right, right. So it's about 50-50. Some guys go there and prosper. Some guys go there and fall off to where their coach at, uh, you know, uh, West Virginia or, you know what I mean? Like right, somewhere right. that's not glamorous, but they know what they're doing or they know you personally after four or five years. They basically have the combination to what makes you better or what keeps you from declining. And I figured, yeah, I'm in West Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, as I look outside, it's gray right now, <laughs> uh, middle of May. But the coaches and the sporting, the um, sports med staff and mm. the weight weightlifting staff, and everybody knows me after about eight years. Right, right. So it doesn't make sense to go to California and start fresh. Right, for sure. Go, you know. So that was kind of my mindset even then, and you know, he agreed and stayed around. I think that's part of why I've been improving steadily. Right. Um, because even though there's it's been the same environment and you know i'm familiar with the people they know me and things like that the facilities and everything but there has been slight changes year to year for example my first year out of college i worked with chris giacchino mm -hmm. and um we did a lot of triphasic work so you know just uh eccentric loading isometric and then we'd have like two weeks of concentric before we start the whole thing over yeah, yeah. and um i think it was getting popular around that time but up until then, I had never heard of anything like that to where it's like strictly eccentric work for like two, three weeks at a time, things like that. Right, right. So um, with Ryan, it's kind of, there's elements of that. There's a lot of the conjugate uh, method. So, so it's like, even though I'm in the same environment, there's such differences from year to year to where I can still get new stimulus. I can still improve. Right, and, right. You know, it's, it's just, it's a great situation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, at your level, I mean, that, that that's the hardest part is like, okay, what's the what's the minimal effective dose, right? And it's not going to take you mm -hmm. out of you being able to throw, you know? And we've talked about this. Absolutely. We can go into this a little bit now if you want to. Um, like you're always battling something, you know? Like I think last time when I was out at when I was out there with you, uh, I think your I think it was your was your wrist still bothering you at that point, something like that. Like you've been going in and out of different stuff, you know? Like you had the ankle issue for a while, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Like, you know, how have you? How yeah, do you that, balance that? How do you? How do you deal with that when that comes around? Like, what does that affect your throwing training? Like the skill work. Obviously, it's going to affect weightlifting in some way. But you know, how do you balance yeah, around just, that? It's, well, you had a good memory because that the ankle I destroyed that in 2017. Mm -hmm. I'd been uh, touring Europe, and then as soon as I came home, um, <laughs> went to practice so that one Monday and rolled my ankle. And uh, would you hit the block on a? Just, would you step on the block on yeah, the? Yeah. Well, Mm -hmm. So all my weight came down at that angle, mm. the sweetest spot possible. Ugh. So I stretched all the ligaments on the outside and I crushed the inside. So I was in a boot for about two months, and uh, you know couldn't do anything. So even till today, it's still stiff, but I have full yeah, strength yeah, yeah. and everything. So I think um, I started 2018 by um, I'd wear a brace from my training sessions, and then I reduced it to just some tape. And then after that, I think I got to the point where I was comfortable enough and I did enough of the rehab. Yep. And um, by the time the first meet rolled around in January, you know, I was out of the boot completely. Right, right, right. But I was cleaning. So this was in January, right? After, basically when I'm comfortable with my ankle. And I'm cleaning and, you know, I love pulls, especially high pulls. And um, for some reason I was catching this day and um, I was going for one 80 for three caught the first one put it down caught the second one put it down caught the third one correctly quote unquote because i have you know, i've, <laughs> have, uh, lim I've uh, got limitations yeah you know? so i i caught it quote unquote correctly and i still wound up spraining my right wrist yeah yeah so out of the window goes my bench press which is very important um behind the neck push press very important explosive push-ups very important and actual throwing which is very important. Right. Cause and that's your, that's your throwing world. hand. Right. So yeah. Right. And at the world championships coming up, um, the, in March that year. So I was just missing a lot of training and uh, that it basically held me back. And, um, I think I got 12th place at the championship. Didn't make the final. So it doesn't matter. Finals top eight. And, um, then I had the Commonwealth games which was April mm -hmm. and I had rehabbed enough to the point where I was back with the heavy lifts. I did a, a 500 pound bench with bands. Yep. Uh, just basically loading up that bucket to where as soon as I go to Australia, 
dump just that dump shit it all out. out. Yeah. Just and it it worked out. You yeah, know? man. Changed my situation financially and stuff. But um, yeah, that's kind of what the story was. I went from the ankle injury to the wrist injury, came out of it, and then um, I think from 2018 to 2019 indoors, I was pretty lucky as far as health goes. But um, I had a hand injury, and it was basically my finger. Um, the ball slipped one time, and you know we always chalk up just like lifters do, yep. uh, just so it doesn't slip. But the ball slipped, and I wound up throwing a 17-pound ball, 69 feet, with just my middle finger. Oh. <laughs> I like that. That just like <laughs> tweaked me for a second. Sorry, God, man. It, it was just bad. Yeah. And I think up, I felt it up until um, this past February. Wow. Yeah, well, I mean, it was because you didn't did really damage there. Because you didn't really like take a step back after that, really. Like, I mean, you you still kept, no. you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't have a chance to. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, this part of what pays the bills. So right. I had to hit meets after meets after meets. So I would do my rehab stuff, and I change the way I tape my fingers and things like that. But of course, in throwing, there's limitations to how you can protect your hand. Right, right. So you can tape the bottom knuckles, but you can't really do much yeah, with as the, far fingers. As the fingers go. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah, really, it's it similar. It's similar with weightlifting. Like, like if they in bigger competitions, local ones are really not too too crazy, depending on who's the judge. But they'll look at like your knee wraps or your sleeves, and are you hiding something underneath your sleeves to give yourself better support so you can get out of the hole better? How much tape you're using mm-hmm. on your hands? Like they do all that stuff, you know. Like they just yeah. passed. You used to not be able to wear anything below your elbow, like for sleeve wise. So you couldn't wear long sleeves when you were lifting. So they just changed oh, wow. it. So now you can wear them as long as I, th- I believe as long as they're. And no, if if anyone's listening to this, and I'm saying something completely wrong, I'm sorry. But but there's like a sp- there's specific like you know resist like um, rules to how long a sleeve could be and stuff like that now too. Um, okay. Because I remember being at a meet and this yeah. girl had her wraps like the you know the Russian knee wraps. Yeah. Right. So she had them literally from like mid quad, like down to like mid calf. And the judge, like, she literally walked on the platform and he walks over and like puts his foot on the bar and goes, No, 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 no. Rewrap your legs. Like, that's way too much. It was like I was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I was like, Well, he's oh, he's doing his job, you know. But yeah. um All right, cool, man. Yeah, so, so how's so what's yeah, it so, what was it like going from like cause I mean, how big are meets at for like college? Like I know like I've seen like the the pole vaulters going down, everyone's clapping, having a good time, like, you know, the whole situation, stuff like that, like what was that difference going from college to the professional level of competition? Like track and field in the rest of the world is a pretty, pretty big sport. Like I remember watching like Olympics oh, and yeah. like high level stuff on TV and it's packed all the way from one door to the other, you know? So that must've yeah. been kind of a, a culture shock kind of thing for you at one point. Yeah, you a, know? Little bit. a little bit. Like if we have a uh, certain meets that you probably heard of like Drake relays, uh, pin relays, and those are massive meets as yeah. far as um, attendance goes the talent level, things like that. So if you look at meets like that in the U.S., they don't come very often. Right. But overseas, there it's pretty much there's several all of the them yeah. going on all the time. And um, track is so big that people know what they're watching as opposed right. to the U.S. Like if, in America, it might be I'm here to support my team or something like that, or I heard there's an event, like what's going on. Whereas when I went to Gothenburg, Sweden, you know, people knew who I was. Actually. I had some fans, quote unquote. I mean, they are fans. I, I gotta be. I'm, I, I'm being groupies. Humble, you got some groupies. They, they were, they were groupies, man. And <laughs> they showed up with pictures of me laminated. For no me shit. Autograph. That's awesome, though. That's cool. And I mean, it was the coolest experience. I never turned down pictures just because that's such a, it's such a, a humbling experience. Yeah. Know? So I never turned down autographs. Never turned down pictures. Doesn't matter how tired I am, how annoyed I am, because travel sucks. But when when you see those fans and they're they're super excited to see you it's it's kind of a a, it brings you back down to earth you know yeah for sure but the the first time i saw that was in you know gothenburg sweden i saw it in ireland and they have you know pictures of me and at the time you know i've improved a lot since 2017 right but i felt like i I really didn't do shit at the at that point in time (laughs) so it's like now like the attention is even bigger and better yeah but uh it's just like it it let me realize i've kind of arrived and um, it's something to live up to now. For you know? sure, yeah. So it's just a great experience. And then, you know, like you were saying earlier, the attendance is massive. Yeah. So at the Commonwealth Games, I believe it was about 60,000 people in the stadium. Wow. wow. And when we were going, there were no races going on. So they, the crowd was looking down at us and the spotlight was on us, even in qualifying. 
Um, I have a picture on my Instagram where I'm waving at the crowd and yep. all those dots, those are people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those, you know, where you'd see that in a, a big sporting event or, you know, football players would be used to that, but as a track athlete, you know, or, you know, wrestling or anything like that, yeah. like the Olympic sports, we, we've never seen anything like that. Yeah. So it's kind of a, it was a, a humbling moment that, you know, when I first saw that attention and people came up to me asking for advice or, I remember right before I hit the Olympic standard in Poland this past summer, um, yeah, I, I, I'm throwing and just wearing some beat up sweats and stuff like that. I, I don't really care how I am before the comp. And this little girl comes to watch and then her sister comes to watch and then an old man comes <laughs> and then he calls his wife over. And then all of a sudden it's a group of people watching me just kind of take not very yeah. good throws, getting ready for a competition. So things like that are, it's like, it's a really fun experience. That's cool, man. That's really cool. Um, all right. So we already went through like your training background, you know, like obviously it's important to you. You believe, you believe that it's something big. It's something that you've wanted to do since you were in high school. You know, we discussed that. Yeah. So like, what, what does throwing mean to you? And like, what, what do you have to say to people that like want to get into it? Like whether it's, young throwers that are trying to get into it young anybody you know just somebody just trying to you know get into the gym what they need to do stuff like that like what does the gym mean to you mean to your sport mean to you know your soul mean to somebody else that you can teach them I mean the kids you're teaching now and in, in high school and stuff like that you know like obviously that's a completely different world for you right like that mm -hmm. was because i remember i think you just started when i was out there you had just started helping out the team yeah. and stuff like that um, cause I remember you were like picking Ryan's brain. You'd come into the office. We would all sit down and like have like a little shit show talk. And we would just like rant on something else. Come back, you know, the normal, <laughs> you know, office talk, it's but good. it's good so, times. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the, as far as training in the weight room, um, it's a big opportunity for you to set some goals, some personal goals for yourself. Um, find a way to get better. Cause a lot of times we look for kind of where we fit in the world or where we fit in our social groups or where we fit even on social media. Um, we always compare ourselves to other people. And for me, the weight room was something that allowed me to get into better shape. You know, when I was younger, you know, elementary, middle school, I was kind of a uh, chubbier. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I wanted a way to get back into shape, um, get back in shape, but get to, into shape, For sure. you know, not feel sluggish if I'm running around and stuff like that with some of my friends, like mm -hmm. not stop and start wheezing and things like that. So the weight room was a good, um, opportunity for me to just fix my kind of self image mm -hmm. and um, set some goals and be able to have, kind of assign value. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, you're nothing if you don't have a big power clean or a big bench press, but it's something that you can work on. So even if it's not big, if you improve on your own stats or if you set your own goals, crush your own goals, I think it's something positive for you mentally and, and spiritually. And the, the weight room, I think, is a perfect um, environment for me to do that. Throwing is another example of that because it's something you can measure. You know, the, the tape doesn't lie. Right. So if the right. ball went an inch farther, two inches farther, that's like, okay, I'm an inch or two inches better. Or if you've had a better series than the last meet, it's something that's quantifiable. Right. So it's, I just, I look at the, the physical uh, expressions of, you know, improvement or your strength, your speed, or even your health, your heart rate, stuff like that. For sure. Um, yeah. It's yeah, it's it's good for the mental, and that's something I try to impart on the kids I'm coaching, because I know for a fact that you know some guys will show up and they're throwing 20 feet, and at the end of three months they're throwing 46 feet, and then some guys will show up throwing 20, and then at the end of two three months they're throwing 21. Yeah, and I you know it's it's a genetic lottery kind of yeah. same way. You know, I'm five foot ten, five eleven, and there's some guys at six foot seven. There's some guys that are five foot two and you right. know, it's, you know, you, you all have a different deck of cards, but can you get better? Can you learn yourself or can you improve in ways that make you feel better by the time you get out of here, you know, or, you know, you're on the team to throw shot, put or discus, but can you know how to properly hinge at the waist? Mm. Can you know how to properly squat by the time we get out of here? These are things I, I really want to impart on my, my students more so than getting them a track scholarship. Right. Right. No. And I mean, like in that whole, what's the word I'm looking for here? Like that whole, I don't want to say grind. That's not what I'm looking for. But like that, just that drive to that commitment, I guess is what I'm looking for. I mean, like I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of like 
high level athletes like you know having a coach come and look at them or a coach comes to watch one player at a high school game and then the coach comes before and after to see who stays to do extra shots who stays to do extra conditioning and like the person that they were going to recruit they completely put him off to the side and they take the kid that didn't even see the court because before the game they were out there dribbling shooting getting warmed up ready to go and they were on the bench cheering people on after the game they stayed and did like 400 more suicides and layups you know like that Mm -hmm. kind of like what you're doing for those kids and thank you for what you're doing because I mean, like now I've, I just started, I just started getting into that too, because I'm dealing with like kids from 10 years old all the way through high school now, where before (laughs) it was like, I was dealing with kids that were coming into D1, D2, D3 colleges, like kids that have already gone through all that. But a lot of those kids come in and they're like, well, I'm already here. Why do I need to give a shit? It's like, that's where we step in and having a good coach like yourself to come in and be like, do like, you need to do this, not for sports, not for this, for you so that you can later Mm -hmm. go on. Like. Oh, this is something that we try to, I mean, you've, you've seen it at, at the college level. Like coaches try to instill like that, you know, better life lessons into sure. the gym, into throwing, whatever it is, so that when they get mm-hmm. out of college, it's not just like my identity's gone. I'm not a thrower. I'm not a basketball player. I'm not, you know. Um, right, right, so, right. I mean, thank you for stepping up and getting into that and being able to do that. That's awesome. You know, I remember when you started I doing it and how it. excited you were about it. So that's that's awesome that you stayed with it. That's sick. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. So uh, we talked a little bit about this too, um, training wise. Because I remember we sat down. Because I think I asked you at one point when you were I, like I spotted you at one point or something, and I was like, so like you're training now, like who's your coach, whatever. And you were like, I don't have one. I come in and I do X, Y, and Z, and that's my plan, you know. And obviously before you had mm-hmm. a coach, and then now obviously right. you're working with Ryan and stuff like that a little bit. So like, how what were the ones that you felt? did better why did you decide to go to yourself why did you decide to go to ryan like that kind of process like what was your thought process to it where are you trying to go now obviously quarantine we'll get into and how you're changing stuff for quarantine because that's a little different but um Mm. but yeah let's start with that like how was you know from high school to college to professional and like in and out of you being able to do your own stuff like how did that change how's your training been for that yeah so uh, for high school it was kind of a i just i ran the show kind of myself so i learned the basics in weight training class and um as far as having goals out on the field i was kind of trying to follow what some of the bigger guys out in new jersey or out in you know massachusetts were doing for sure um and crafting my own workouts Mm -hmm. so i did that from sophomore year up until junior year and then my senior year i had a personal coach that helped me out with uh, some direction okay and um by the time i got to college i was working with ross bowser who was a a world junior um, powerlifting champion. Okay. So he had some experience. He squatted 875 in competition, for example. So it's just um, I had a, a good pool of experts to go to. You know, uh, Grant Thorne, Grant Guy, um, Dwayne Carlisle. Just a, basically that that group of Purdue sports performance coaches. It, you know, always high qualifications and mm-hmm. always pretty much experts at what they do. So I was lucky enough to have that throughout all five years that. I was eligible for, for track and field, and um, at the end of my first year of professional, uh, Keith McBride wound up leaving, um, Coach Chris wound up leaving, and um, I was kind of in a vacuum by myself. Yeah. All that remained the same was, um, you know, the fact that I was able to work out with the team. So I used that opportunity to kind of not change too much. I continued the things I learned prior and started to write my own workouts. And that's actually when I got the silver medal in Australia at the Commonwealth Games and okay. the African Championship. So that was under my own coaching as far as throwing and lifting. So it wasn't really a choice of mine. It was just kind of, you know, the coaches I'd worked with were leaving and I was in the same environment. Yeah. So either I stay and, you know, kind of do my own thing or I follow somebody somewhere. Right, right. So did that and it kind of worked out. I was you know, a little, little bit of trial and error, but... I'm also the type that keeps all the workouts from prior to study. So I I look at workouts that I get, like a workout card, to kind of get my mind right. Yeah. So let's say I, if I have to bench 475 for three, it, for me it's a big mental, spiritual experience. So I watch videos of people that have done it. I kind of try to get myself right before I have the actual workout. Right, for sure. And um, so I keep all that stuff even after. And um, it was something I was able to refer to. So stuff that Coach Ross had written for me, Coach Chris, Coach Keith, um, and 
I was also picking you guys' mind, picking you guys' brain. Um, you, uh, Ryan, especially at the time, because he wasn't working with a track team. Right. But um, I was just, you guys were around, so I was talking to you as much as possible and um, got some success from it. So I just kind of rode that out till I got a new coach uh, in Jermaine Jones for the throws. And yep. then Ryan was a part of the track team. So, um, yeah, it was just kind of a, a constant evolution. But I think that experience then allowed me to kind of now when things are kind of closed down and limited to pick up from, you know, where we left off in March, where things are back to where pretty much normal. So, you know, now I'm having makeshift lifts and things like that, but yeah. I'm writing my own, um, you know, program. And, you know, I, I have some confidence based on that kind of experiment that I went through in For sure, 2018. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know if, I don't know if you've, you've seen this or not, but uh, we started a competition week three is coming up um this week this is starting tomorrow monday um and we've been like kind of giving different goals for like each week right so week one was just you know setting a base getting back into things or starting for the first time week two um was pick like make sure you're recording all of your stuff down like you were just saying and pick one mm. dietary thing that you know you do horrible like if you drink soda right cut that out for the week you know try to focus on doing something or like instead of eating a bag of chips have like an apple or something like pick one thing and kind of get used to it um and mm. we've we've been lucky enough that rp strength got in on the on our competition and they're helping us out so everyone's getting like two weeks free for the last two weeks and then oh, nice. whoever wins the competition the two winners of the competition is going to get six months free of rp um but like we've been trying to hound like recording and why it's so important and stuff like that. And like you just saying, mm -hmm. you know, like I saved everything so I can go back and look at it. Even if you went back right. and looked at it and said, I have no fucking idea why I'm doing this. Right. Like you were able to go back and be like, I remember this and this worked. Why does this mm -hmm. work? Right. So, I mean, if exactly. you want to, I mean, I might've just answered the question, but I mean, to you, like, is that why you saved that stuff? Like to be able to go back and, you know, cause yeah. I feel like yeah. some people save stuff and they just go back and be like, Oh, I remember doing this and I just go and do it instead of like, writing yourself notes down being like this is working keep going you know like or oh, whatever you know mm -hmm. like what are common, some of the yeah. stuff that you do for that like yeah so that's that very important so i'll save the actual card um so one thing i'll do is i'll take pictures or keep the physical card on me um another thing is I, i've done this off and on but especially in the past couple years i actually have a physical journal mm -hmm. so after a session i have my body weight uh, how i feel physically obviously the day the previous day's workout and then what i did how i did and then there's good and then there's bad things i need to improve on and um that's just that's a way to tie in all my training to see progress over time and um this past year was very important because i was getting over an injury and i was kind of able to see how i responded to previous workouts so there'll be days where i do my usual squat workout and i feel like total crap yeah throw like total crap and then there's days where I respond positively to a, a change. So seeing things like that, especially if I experienced a similar situation uh, or you're know, an injury down the line or something like that, or even something as simple as body weight. Yep. You know, at, at the beginning of the year, I was almost 290 and I felt sluggish, you know, as opposed to maybe if I changed my body composition a little bit or if I just cut some weight while trying to maintain strength, I feel better. So now I have point of reference to where i'm not guessing you know there's a little bit of consistency a little bit of science behind for it. sure yeah absolutely. i think i think everyone can benefit from that okay cool um so your motivation right where where does that come from was there like a pivotal moment were there inspirations for you that got into it i mean i know we've already i've already said this a thousand times but you were like you said like you started with the weight like you wanted to weightlift because you saw you know mm. wrestlers eddie guerrero whoever it was you know superfly snooker whoever the hell it was that you saw wrestling you know like yeah. was that something that kind of was like an inspiration to you is that still like where do you get it from what you know what's your motivation how why how do you keep it going you know i think that's a big thing for a lot of yeah. people is you know finding that self-motivation and it's from a different places so that that was definitely the first one and the most significant um you know i come from a pretty strong family anyway so my little brother is a thrower now mm -hmm. and uh you know he's putting up some weights i remember when i bench pressed 500 pounds i told my older brother trying to you know hey you know <laughs> <I just did laughs> yeah. <that. laughs> flexing a little like, bit 
he's kind of like, yeah, what took you so long? He does that for the, you know, so I love it. His bench is, yeah. It, so it, I was always kind of trying to measure myself against my older brother, and you know, my little brother is coming behind me, and so things like that kind of keep me in a groove for sure. Um, just you know, out, outside of organized sport, and um, the wrestling thing comes back in because now I have some eyes on me. There's a little bit of a following on social media, and people expect a certain thing out of me at big competitions. Um, right now, I'm number eight in the world. So now I kind of look at myself as almost an entertainer in those situations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, I, have, I have some expectations. And um, I think part of what helped me realize that was um, one of my teammates kind of pulled me aside because I had a string of bad competitions. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing is, that was related to an injury. But at the same time, I was kind of doubting myself some harsh articles came out about you know my disappointing performances and stuff like that and um which i mean i was throwing 67 feet which is like uh, why aren't you throwing 70 right yeah, yeah yeah so it's like you know d new levels new devils so oh i like that I came one. back to america i like that yeah, one a lot yeah. and uh, he, he's like you know just go out there and have some fun yeah and i think that's part of what led me to looking at myself as an entertainer mm -hmm. or you know, just literally, if I throw a big throw, like I threw the seventy footer in Switzerland, I did a cartwheel and yeah, toe touch at the world. Man, I love that. I loved all those. Those are my favorite videos, man. It's just you enjoying it's, it. That's awesome. It's like just having fun because we work so hard, and you you know about this. You know, as far as weightlifting goes, you work so hard to get to the platform, or you work so hard to get to the ring, and then you do all that pretty much to forget it because it's it's automatic at that point. So now you're just going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You make your decision or you make your game plan and you execute it without thinking too much. You're getting in the ring and you're not thinking about turning the left foot or you're not thinking about sprinting to the middle and putting the foot down. You've taken all your reps. You've done all your snatch balances and your clean pulls and your jerks and your this and that in order for it to be automatic. Right, right. And I think I'd forgotten to keep things automatic at that point. So swinging back to the motivation part, I think when he told me just go out there and have fun, that's when I realized that, okay, if I go out there loose, maybe I can hit that Olympic standard. Maybe I can make the world championship final. Maybe I can throw a PB, right. you know, things like that. So as far as motivation comes, I think from people around me um, and then kind of the old, um, you know, want to be like a professional wrestler. Right. So I'm in a different kind of ring. You know the audience is expecting something different but there is an audience and i am a performer so it's, it's uh i think it's kind of it comes full circle now yeah for sure yeah i mean listen man like from the stuff that i've watched and i've watched you like whether it was live on tv or whatever or seeing your highlights and stuff like that the one thing that the commentators and they always post like what like i'm pretty sure i've seen videos of them talking about you and never even shown you throwing it's just you having fun and doing the flips and doing the stuff like that and they're like he's one of a kind like it's true like keep doing that shit man like be one of yeah. a kind you know that's awesome i love it yeah, definitely, definitely um how much time do you have left i don't want to like suck up your whole day if you're you know no i'm, All I'm right. good All right, i got a couple i got a couple more for you a couple more for you um <laughs> so competitions right do you have any like rituals for your competitions do you have any you know no um i used to uh, when i was a freshman and sophomore in college i'd wear the same pair of black socks for every com <laughs> okay <laughs> I love it. I don't it. know why. Yeah. I mean, when I'm looking at it back as a 27 year old, I'm like, okay, who told me in the first place that that was a lucky pair of socks? Yeah. So I'm thinking that I had one good track meet and I didn't want to change what worked. Uh -huh. So forget the throwing, forget the weightlifting, forget the eating and the mental prep. For some reason, I equated it to the pair of black socks I had on. <laughs> And I, I just took that with me. Oh. Well, one day I, I forgot to pack the black socks, so I had all white socks and put a pair on. And I threw well, so that superstition goes out the window. Yeah. So as, as far as like, like strict rituals, that was the only one I've had, and that's gone out the window. Okay. But uh, other than that, I, I do have a kind of a routine where um, I always mix my pre-workout before the competition like way before so if i'm competing at like 5 p.m my pre-workout is powdered and at the bottom of my shaker at around 10 a.m and i just i don't know why i'm super particular about the bottle being extremely dry 
So it's not uncommon to see me like take a clean shaker bottle, wash it, towel it dry, use a hair dryer to dry it even more, <laughs> and then put my pre workout. Got to get every grain. Summer. Every grain. I've always been so particular about it. So I'll put that aside, get the rest of my bag ready. So basically, my pre workout takes more precedent over my shoes or my wrist strap or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I get the bag ready. Um, I always have a pair of uh, earphones, but the thing is, I don't listen to pump up music. Okay. I'll probably I'll be listening to some pop, like maybe a Michael Jackson song or something like that. Okay. To kind of. I can get behind me, that. Yeah. I can get behind yeah. that. And because uh, I'm, if you are aggressive, but you don't want to be tight. Right. For sure. So yeah, that's that's kind of what keeps me loose a little bit, and then I make sure I eat um, about two hours before competition. It's about right, yeah. So it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just for a little bit of fuel, but that's pretty much it. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not too strict except about the shaker bottle in my pre workout. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Uh, how many, how many comps do you usually do a year? Is there like a because? So they just started doing this for weightlifting. Uh, I think last year, two years ago. It, the only reason I keep comparing it to that is obviously because like that's the world that I'm living in now, and I'm trying to like oh, focus course. on that more. But, like, they've required people, and I think this is just more to regulate, you know, doping and, like, different things like that and steroid use, obviously, stuff like that. So they're trying to – they're forcing people to hit a certain amount of, like, bronze, silver, and level uh, – gold level competitions every year so that you have to, like – you might get tested, so you have to show up. So there's some yeah. people that just go way in, and if they don't get tested, they don't even compete, but it counts as them, like, going to the meet and stuff like that. So is there okay. like requirements for you that you have to hit regardless of separate from like sponsorships or whatever it is? Um, um no, there, there's no real requirement for that. Um, I know last year I had 14 competitions. Wow. Okay. So that, yeah, it was a long year and it was a painful year. Yeah. I was gonna say that uh, sounds like a lot. In, yeah. Yeah. Super long. I started December, 2018 in Nigeria. And then of all those meets, I think, Two of them were in America. Okay. The rest of it was in Europe somewhere, Doha, Qatar. Yeah, yeah. Um, but as far as anti-doping, what they do is um, for the top 10 in the world, we have to submit our whereabouts. So it's through the AIU, the Athletics uh, Integrity Unit. And yeah, if I go to my you know girlfriend's house or I go to my mom's house, that has to be on file. And I have to basically be within 60 minutes of the tester. And if I'm not there, or if there's an issue with the paperwork, it counts as a strike. Three strikes in a 12 month period is an automatic positive test. So they, they put me on that as soon as I got eighth at the world championships. Yeah, so they have my dad's house, Damn. my mom's house. So like every uh, time you go somewhere, field. you have to record it somehow and let them know? Now, the, the thing is, if I go somewhere that I'd be maybe an hour from home. Okay. That, that's where it gets a little shaky. Okay. So like, as far as like day to day training, they have my, you know, they have Mollenkopf, for example, they have Mackie, right. uh, Lambert Fieldhouse. They have all those addresses where I might be. And they, they happen to be within, you know, 15 minutes of each other. But if I go, let's say to a friend's house in Ohio and you know, Hey, you've been randomly se selected for a drug test. Well, I might be four hours away, but I have 60 minutes to, re you know, report. Yeah. 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 And if I, if I miss, I miss automatically. There's no kind of, hey, let's Damn. meet in the middle or anything okay. like that. So that, that's so does that, the past. So, so this is all new to me. I've never looked into any of this. So this is something interesting I've never heard of. So do they? So does that like require you to live in certain areas so that you're near a testing person? Or do they just like they fly in if they're going to randomly test you and be like, hey, we're in the area for a test? I think it's they'll fly in. And, okay. All right. Um, you, basically, you just can't move. Right. So you can't be away from wherever it is on file. So, you know, wherever your address is, that's where they're going to assume that they can reach you. Wow. And if okay. for some reason you don't show up there on time, then, hey, you're automatically guilty until proven innocent. Wow. Okay. And it's damn near impossible to be to proven, proven innocent. innocent. Yeah. yeah. Damn. Okay. That's interesting. I've never heard of that before. That's cool. Okay. Well, yeah. cool. Appreciate and, uh, you know, you know, it's good for the sport, right? Like... But you're you're always on eggshells. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, there's there's nightmare stories of people being like, yeah, it was three thirty in the friggin' morning, and my door just <laughs> pee in the cup. Yeah. You know, like, so. That's real life. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the life that you guys live, huh? So, all right. Yeah. You can turn this question down. 
All right. Olympics. Obviously, that was the goal for this year. You were going. Like, that was, you know. Um, and hopefully with the way things are going, hopefully next year will happen. It will happen next summer. That would be amazing for everybody. Um, obviously, you're not the only Olympian in the same in the same boat you know so sure how are you like what are your thoughts on that concerns how are, are you are you excited to have an extra year maybe to like kind of push yourself a little bit more is it you know obviously it's upsetting you know like what would you say to other olympians in your position and stuff like that you know yeah I, to other olympians just kind of um like you said it's out of our control it's we're not alone in it so my friends my peers i have a lot of friends that were um this would be their last Olympics, or that's the ultimate goal. So right. for me, I missed 2016 by five centimeters. So the standard at the time was 2050. I threw 2045 at a like my third meet after graduating. So I was chasing that mark, got close and missed it. And um, one of my good buddies told me, "Don't get mad, get better." Yeah. yeah. So all I, I watched it on TV. I was like, "All right, 2020, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna figure out how to." throw 2050 i'm gonna throw 2050 all the time i'm gonna be able to throw 2050 in my sleep now if i throw 2050 it's like dude what happened yeah you know so it's like i've come a long way um and then for the past three years it's like a question of well you think you're gonna qualify are you gonna qualify you think you can qualify yeah yeah and then july 2019 um i qualify and then it's like, okay, well, that monkey's off my back. I'm going to the games. I'm going to get those rings tatted on me. And oh, yeah, me. baby. You know, it's, it's going to be kind of a culmination of my whole career. And then COVID happens. So just kind of to, to set the stage on how big of a blow it was to me. But at the same time, I was like, you know what? I'm going to be sad. I think it's normal to be sad. If you're not sad, then it didn't mean anything to you. Right. So I was sad as hell. Um didn't train for a couple of weeks, just kind of as a deload physically and mentally. And then when I was able to train the next time, I was right back at it. So, you know, my advice is just you don't give up on the dream that quickly. You know, things can change in 12 months for the better or for right. the worse. But right. you have to give yourself the best chance of, you know, doing something. Uh, so I have every intention on being in Tokyo, you know, July 2021. Will it happen? I don't know, but I, at least I know now that as far as my ranking, they take top 32 in the world, and I made sure my ranking was top 10 for the past year plus. Yep. So even at the, at the moment, I'm sitting eighth. Mm -hmm. um, the standard, they wanted a 21 meters 10. I threw 21 meters 80, and I threw 21 meters, um, I think, I think at 11 of those 14 meets, I threw 21 meters. So basically, I gave myself the best possible shot and I owe it to myself to keep trying. Yeah. So I think Olympians have similar stories. It may not be the same sport. It may not be the same journey, but you have a similar story of you made sacrifices. You put your body through hell. You put your mind through hell. Your friends and family through hell. Yeah. Missed opportunities and things like that. So what's the point of quitting now when there's a chance possibly in July 2021 right. to be in Tokyo and, and achieve your dreams? And then on the flip side of it, those who haven't achieved the standard shit keep going yeah go for it now now you have a mulligan so just keep so are they now extending have... are they extending the like the well, actual uh, way for you to get into it now like to actually qualify are they so kind of um in track and field what they did is they i'm glad you asked that question they froze the date um of qualifying so for example we had from may 1st um 2019 up until June, maybe 30th of uh, 2020 to qualify. So what they did is when the outbreak happened in mid-March, they were kind of deliberating. Should we have the meet? Should we not have the meet? And once they decided on postponing it, they said, because of the virus, we're gonna shut down everything as far as ranking and qualifications from April 6th up until December 1st. Wow. And I okay. think that was, that was kind of to keep people at home because you know like you know this in weightlifting wrestlers track athletes you know tennis players you want to get out there you want to compete yeah we're driven to do this oh yeah so unless they say something like okay you guys should not try to chase the standard in this dangerous time period we're going to be out there i, I was saying it myself like 
if we have meets and I have a chance of improving my standard, I'm, I'm going. going. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't even think about it, you know. Yeah. It's, you know, I have yeah. asthma. I, I'm at risk, but that's the, it's kind of the mindset that we either we have at the start or we develop over time with all the sacrifices and it's almost like a drug like you feel oh good yeah when you've lifted some heavy ass shit oh yeah, you feel oh, like, yeah. You know, so it's uh you know it, I, I hear they, i hear that one of, yeah that's they, they wanted to protect us from ourselves yeah <laughs> oh, so, yeah well they yeah. they so, everyone goes you know like oh college athletes are a special animal you know it's like oh professional athletes are a special animal right but then it's like olympians you're 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 the like the tip of the mountain right like if they're special animals, like you guys are through the sky, like we can't even see you. Like you guys are above the clouds. Like it's out, you know. So like, I mean, and like you said, like the commitment you guys put into it, like it's it's been your whole, almost your whole life, or a better part of your yeah. life has been, you know. So, all right. Well, I mean, listen, keep it up, man. Keep it up, baby. Yeah. I mean, you're you're For you're sure. already there. I remember. God, I might, I might chew myself on the foot on this one. I think when we were talking, when I was still there, you were aiming. Was it for twenty two? You were still aiming for, or was it the twenty one five you were aiming no. for? So, oh, I wanted twenty one five. Okay, yeah. and now you're, and so you've was, shown that over... consistency now. So now you're showing that consistency. Yeah. You said eleven out of fourteen, right? You were throwing twenty one eighty, right? So, no, 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 twenty one eighty is my best. Oh, okay. So I, I threw above twenty one and eleven out of the fourteen. Okay, okay. So yeah, it's uh, and it. I think 22, I've, I've hit that in training. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's something that's going to come out eventually, but um, I, I've kind of separated myself from that 21 mid group and kind of put myself in a little bit of a different stratus. Good. Cool, man. Yeah. So what's the, um, for people at home that don't really follow like higher level sports and stuff like that, like between you and number one, right? Like what's the mm. difference in distance for throwing because i mean i know like for like for most like pole vaulters and stuff like that it could be literally like the same height it's just my friggin' finger hit the friggin' pole like that's like it, literally centimeters you know so it, it could be now for me the difference between me and number one that's two and a half feet really wow at the okay. world yeah at the world championships um the difference between first and second was one centimeter <laughs> and then am I saying that right yeah first and second was one centimeter and then second and third were tied and they had to go to the second best throws to break the tie damn yeah see so that's, that's the metal position so that's crazy it, yeah it can be pretty close yeah that's crazy and that, the things like for for a jumping event like a pole vault or high jump it's more likely that people will be clearing the same bar on the same day but as far as throwing like you have this 16 pound ball yeah and you push it out there as recklessly as possible so it's, it's really unlikely for margins to be that thin right right right. but we we do see it every now and again yeah yeah, yeah. okay all right so now we're down to the nitty-gritty all right nerdy anime gaming sh weird nerdy shit that you do like that kind of stuff like what are some of those kind of things about you you know like yeah so um i don't think i'm a huge nerd but i do have some some things so for example obviously i'm a wwe fan so yep. we we call ourselves smarks like a smart mark so <laughs> i'm on like gamefacts.com and i always post on the forums i almost post more than I actually watch the, the show so i have the show on and i'm talking to other you know quote unquote nerds yeah, across yeah. the internet um i've always been a huge pokemon fan nice. except Big time. recently that like, i think after um after the third season, so I, okay. with uh, Kanto, I was you know 151 Mew and Mewtwo and stuff like that. Yeah, I was on board. When they moved to Johto, I was on board. Everything I, I knew, all the new ones, and then even Hoenn, that's like, like Ruby and Sapphire. Yeah, I knew all the Pokemon, and then as soon as they went to the fourth season, it just kind of fell off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they keep adding new ones, and then they go backwards, and they add like a for example Magmar was a basic Pokemon and then they added Magby, which is the baby. Yeah. So it's like they're kinda they're going back and rewriting everything we knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that kinda like throws me off a little bit. And um that's I kinda like Digimon because there's so many different branches. Yeah. That they, they there's no reason for them to go backwards anyway. Right, right. They right. just add more branches forwards. So I'm a big So Digimon, fun fact big fan. fun fact, new Digimon series is coming. 
an animated series and a new they're doing a new pokemon on uh netflix and it's gonna entail all of the regions it's gonna be ash oh, wow. with like the the a new character from like the sword and shield that has like the has score bunny the the fire bunny you know and he's yeah. gonna have pikachu and they're gonna somehow this is my issue too is like how are they gonna tie in all the things that they've done you know it makes no sense oh. to me it's it's way too expansive now. Yeah, but yeah, I yeah. will watch. I will watch for yeah. sure. Yeah, but anyways, continue. Sorry, yeah. I figured to let you know that. Um, yeah. yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and then you know, obviously, I've, I've played all the games. Another thing is, um, I was a Game Boy fan, okay, more so than the bigger consoles. Um, so I had a Game Boy, had a Nintendo DS, and the only reason I bought a current generation system is because there's a handheld version to it. Mm-hmm. So I'm a Switch owner. Big my all man. The, all right. Yeah. Oh yeah. I got the Nintendo games and mine's right in front of me. Yeah. There you go. I mean, ready to go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So um there's that. I kept up with Dragon Ball Z. Nice. I didn't like it quite as much growing up because uh I was kind of forced into it. Okay. So my older brother would put it on TV and then I'd sit there and just watch. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then I kind of warmed up to it, kind of the, the story behind the, the anime. Um so I, I think that's, that's kind of it. Just uh I'm a huge fan of the those animes particularly but i don't like watch one piece or, right, right. or anything like that. yeah yeah, yeah. okay i think some of the the more mainstream stuff i yeah okay you Definitely might like so since you're a dbz fan you might like my hero academia big time it's okay. very um it's like the world like all of a sudden the world exploded and like people have like superpowers they call them quirks okay and okay. they have high schools where you're like training them to be heroes and stuff like that and like this one kid didn't have powers but like the number one hero in the world got injured and like was hiding it and like somehow hands it over to him you just very very good very good i'll look into it check it out it's not bad um so have you do you find like motivation inspiration in any of those like do you get like like from dbz like is there ever a day where you're like i need like to see vegeta training to try to beat goku and i need that right now like honestly now that you mentioned i think I think watching some of the outlandish, outrageous stuff that uh, Goku and Vegeta were doing, like whether they're in the hyperbaric chamber, yeah, yeah. the hyperbolic chamber, um, or Goku doing uh, one finger push ups and things like that, or uh, he was told to do 10,000 push ups and he did it, you know, kind of in uh, 30 seconds, that kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, luckily, I was at the point where I didn't know anything about training. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know anything about weight training, so I was like, I thought I was a smart kid, but I believed some of that bull crap. Yeah, so yeah. So I think it motivated me to kind of get into the best shape possible. I'll share a funny story, though. Um, this was when I was seven years old in the second grade. So I think I was a smart kid, but I, I did get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so my teacher, Miss McCarthy, was just the worst. I don't have trouble, like, dropping her name. <laughs> so Miss McCarthy was the worst. I hated her. I still hate her now, 20 years later. Um, Cause she was just a, a bad lady. Um, some people they they look t- too deep into what kids are doing. Yeah, yeah. And um, I remember Gohan was teaching his girlfriend Videl how to create um, like a, a chi blast. Yeah. Just like to focus it, and he showed her like you have to sit down. Oh, you, you don't have to sit down, but like you have to get comfortable and focus all your energy in one spot. And then before you know it, all your chi is gonna kind of start to smolder, and then you have a, a wave. So I was like, man, I am so mad at Miss McCarthy that I went in my mom's kitchen, sat down on the floor, and focused all my chi because I was going to go back to school and use, like, <laughs> I just a fucking chi blaster. That's awesome. Yeah. So that, that Dragon Ball Z led me down that road. I love it. That's <laughs> awesome. That's big time. Yeah. That's big time. Yeah. All right, man. Well, I mean, got anything to plug? Anything you want to talk about, ask about? Anything, stories you want to give? Go for it. I mean, I think we covered pretty much everything. All right. Um, yeah. Instagram is the Chuck says T H E C H U K S A Y S. Twitter is the same, but I don't tweet quite as much. And then just my name on Facebook. Cool. Go check him out, guys. One of the most explosive, strongest, and best people you'll see. That's very rare to happen. So keep doing what you're doing, man. Thank you for everything you do. Yeah. Um, stick around for a second, and uh, we'll catch up a little bit before we head out here. All right. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. All right. Thanks Later. for having me. No, absolutely. Hope to have you back.
Hey guys, if you liked that video, make sure you smash that like button. Make sure you smash that subscribe button. We have a lot more coming up. We already have a bunch of interviews set up and ready to go, okay? We have a mix of coaches, athletes. We got some streamers coming. We got some gamers coming, okay? If you guys have any questions, anything, leave them in the comments below. Any ideas, things that you want to see us do or people you want us to see us interview, make sure you comment that below also, okay? Share the love. We're just trying to give you guys some entertainment, so make sure you guys come in, say hi, leave comments below, let us know what you think. More's coming. Thanks, guys.